rooftop was at capacity under the July 4th afternoon. Independence Day in Seattle was always the first day of summer sun. And on the years it was not, we would barbecue in our shorts all the same. The blue skies remained for the month of July and into August. The city had dreams of warm summer rain. Mr. Colbo and Mr. Bell would meet me at Sun Liquor on Fridays, and Mr. Erickson would be pushing around the tennis courts on Saturday nights. And on Sundays, Lillian and I would meet on First Hill to stand close to the works of Nikolai Fashion. When I tell her she's a superhero, she laughs and tells me stories about Angela Davis on the walk to Bauhaus. Seattle summers forget the seasons of the year, don't they? There's only the rolling grass of Volunteer Park and the fake turf by the courts where the kids drink afternoon beer. But September arrived and the green summer was ending. And so was my tolerance for another dark winter. The boxes of books were the heaviest to carry, and the large canvas from Lyle caused me the most anxiety as the northern winds rocked the truck with gusts and wild raindrops. Douglas firs became redwoods, and the smoke black sky turned to golden light. Camp Lowe was on the AM radio when the grasping hands of fog met me along the Golden Gate Bridge. The Pacific's waters rising in the cool air beyond its dark blue body. In San Francisco, such a city. The ocean water and ocean air cooperating so often to reach up to the streets, joining the peninsula with its mysteries. The white walls stood bare above the carpet, which was of the same color. From my mattress on the floor, the Roman columns triggered associations I kept with New York or Paris, but not San Francisco. Silhouettes of magnolia leaves rattled behind the blue window curtains that danced in the slow breeze. Friday night had poisoned my heart, and so it beat too fast and too heavy. Reed's Mullen Street neighbors, already outside preparing for the afternoon barbecue with the scent of fire in the local air. We ride bikes by Presida Dogs to Folsom, where the protesters flood the streets for a 60-day eviction freeze. Past Dolores, and then DeBose, up the winding panhandle lanes to the green places in Golden Gate Park. Sitting on a hillside above Hellman Hollow, the festival crowd spreads with its colors on the grass. My brother Hank situates himself to a better view of the stage on the generous arm of a Monterey Cypress. On weekdays, I meet Scotty and Carlotta, and we chat on the rooftop on Mullen. The ghosts of the tunnels below the city sing a haunted melody outside the train cars until I find Hank and Miner pushing in circles on the smooth granite by the clock tower. We push around between conversations and the parrots squeal in manic swarms around the palm trees as the dusk light arrives on the shoulders of the monoliths. Some afternoons we push at the sun down Judah, down Lawton, down to the sand where strangers gather to see the metamorphosis in the Pacific sky. Gold, blue, orange, red, pink, and the final dark blue before the night. That last blue with the glow that causes every heart to open up. November disappeared, and so had I, further south once again. And in Los Angeles, the suburban streets are wide and vacant in the night. Fresh painted red curbs hug perfect blades of grass. Yeltubis and Anglionis laugh along to my situations and timid advances. Some two or three things I know about her. I'm around Fullerton. I'm the newcomer again. In the afternoons, we drive to the schoolyards and drainage ditches and business parks. Lost in the LA basin, hunting and gathering. We turn our handheld mirrors to the world to capture the beauties, when really, the beauties have always held the mirrors to us.